Turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. I'm chomping at the bit to get on in the book of Acts. I've been reading it and reading it and reading it, and it's funny how when you're preparing to preach it, though I've read the book of Acts before, how it's seemingly coming alive to me. And I hope that as we journey through this historical account of the first generation truth, that it and it really comes alive to you. Somehow it's easy for us, I think because of our exposure to media and watching movies and that sort of thing, that we can watch things and somehow get involved but still remain detached. I, I hope that as we read and study and look at this historical account, that somehow you will allow yourself to put your, your, your own person into the setting and realize these were real people in real circumstances, experiencing real things, really learning what they're learning, really doing what they're doing. And God dynamically moved in, in that setting where they were, were struggling and, and, and were facing persecution, and yet were bound together through their love for the gospel. And He created out of them a church. That word to us almost has cultural barriers to a church and we automatically think buildings and steeples and properties or maybe we, we get in our mind the, 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 some of the old um, and, and stately cathedrals that are built around the world and, and we think church and that's what we think. The reality of it is we're going to study all the way through this entire book and that concept of church won't appear anywhere in it. There was church before there was building, before there was property. So I hope as we journey together through this book that we'll encounter the dynamics of that first generation church and how I believe that God has never intended for those things to be lost or to change. Not everything we're going to see and understand and know to be church we're going to find in the book of Acts because already in the epistles as Paul is writing to churches we begin to see that things are developing within the church and so it really is a portrait of the church in its infancy where it started with an understanding of why it started and what God's purpose and intention was and so we won't learn everything about the church by studying the book of Acts but we'll learn a lot of things that I think unfortunately particularly in our freedoms in our culture have been lost. But let's continue on in the journey. We kind of saw, in a sense, the end of the gospel. Luke's ending to his gospel actually happens at the beginning of the book of Acts. This is Luke's account of the Great Commission and Christ meeting with his disciples and his ascension to heaven. And we touched on verse 12 as we finished last week. They follow his command. Let's begin reading there. Acts 1 and verse 12. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. Let me stop right there and uh, give you a public apology. Um, I learned very much again this week my axiom, which I should stay with, is stick with the notes, stupid. When I don't do that, I tend to get in trouble. Last week, I, you know, spouted off about how incredible it was that they walked for a whole week back. I should have known I was there. Mount of Olives, Mount Olivet's not a week's journey from Jerusalem. It's actually right there. A Sabbath day's journey would be as far as they were allowed to walk, per the law, on the Sabbath day. It was actually a pretty short journey, which means their prayer meeting was not just for three days because they walked for seven. Their prayer meeting, which we're going to see, was ten days. They abode in one accord and in prayer. Anyway, I'm sorry. Stick with the notes, stupid. Verse 13, And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon Zelotes and Judas the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brethren. And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of names together were about 120, Men and brethren... This scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all of his bowels gushed out. And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, insomuch as that field is called in their proper tongue, a seldoma, which is to say, the field of blood. 
For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein. And his bishopric let another take. Wherefore of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection? And they approved too, or they appointed too. Joseph called Barsabas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, Show whether of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship, from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. And as he always does, the Lord will add his blessing to the reading of his word. It's an interesting passage of Scripture. It almost is kind of one of those passages you kind of read because it's kind of just like historical detail to get on to chapter 2 and verse 1, the day of Pentecost. And I wonder even as I come to this passage of Scripture, why does, why does Luke give such importance to, to, to this? Why, why is it so significant? If you look at the number of verses, he actually spends as many, maybe a little more, uh, of the text on this passage as he does on Christ's encounter with the disciples right before his ascension and is commissioning them to, to carry out his gospel work. Well, the reality of it is it actually stands in the book of Acts in a position of prominence because it has great importance for all that is going to come next. We're going to see in this setting some principles by which this group was going to function some things that become important to them in decision-making that actually will enable them to be in the place where the events of Pentecost can transpire. And then beyond that, as crowds begin to grow, as the church begins to grow, there are principles that they will then follow in carrying out the establishment of the church. And they're found here in this passage of Scripture. We see them... Acting. This, in a sense, is the church's... Well, it's not the church. It hasn't started yet. But the group that God will then use to bring about the church, this is their first business meeting. They're going to con conduct themselves and they're going to use principles that they will follow. Not a huge Johnny Carson fan. But Johnny Carson read an item from the Lost and Found column of a Midwestern newspaper. It struck me. Lost dog. Brown fur. Some missing due to mange. Blind in one eye. Deaf. Lame leg due to recent traffic accident. Slightly arthritic. Answers to the name? Lucky. Why did I read that? Well, because the reality of it is, folks, there is no such thing as luck. If there is luck, it means there's something in the universe that genuinely competes with the Almighty. There's no chance, no fate. Oh, and I know sometimes we, we use those terms flippantly and maybe aren't thinking, and so please don't think I'm being overly condemning that you should never, how dare you ever say good luck. You know, it's almost kind of just an expression we use, and it's more awkward to say fair providence. Fair providence, my friend. But the reality of it is, maybe we could shorten it, text it, FP, fair promise, right? The reality of it is, nothing happens by chance. We are not the products of fate. We're not merely the byproduct of our circumstances. In this passage of Scripture, you're going to see them approach the situation that they're facing with a very clear understanding that God's in control. And that becomes hugely significant for them in the events that are going to transpire throughout the rest of this book. So let's look at the passage of Scripture, and I, I want us to, to see some of the, the amazing things that are incorporated here in this passage of Scripture. We're going to see the speaker. We're going to see a suicide. We're going to see the Scriptures. We're going to see some specifications, and then in the end we're going to see a selection. 
And in those things, we're going to see how they understood who God is and what God was doing and how they were supposed to function in light of who God was and what He was doing. Remember the setting. They've just recently left Christ. And maybe for the first time, they now are beginning at least to grasp that maybe somehow things are going to be okay with Jesus gone. Remember, all through the latter half of His ministry with them, they just, they just couldn't get that. How in the world could He say it was going to be better for them that He go away? Peter absolutely rebelled against that. He said, far be it from you, Lord. I am never going to let that happen. Never am I going to let you get killed. Never am I going to let you go away. Even right up to the night before his betrayal, he said, though, all men forsake you, not me. I am there. I am in. It is on. I am staying. I will die. And you know what? He meant it, folks. He really did. That's why we have the account of him in the garden. Though he fell asleep three times, when he came to, not maybe aware fully of what was going on or how many were there in the, in the, the midst of that crowd, he jumps up and he draws his sword and he strikes the servant of the high priest Malchus and he cuts his ear off. He was ready to go to battle. And then fear set in. Jesus told him, you're going to betray me. Three times before the cock crows, you're going to betray me. And here was this guy with the hero mentality. Not me, no way, uh-uh. He set his heart until that inclination to self-preservation set in. Fear came in. He denied the first time. And much like happens with us, you know, you lie that first time and boy, it, you know, it's hard, isn't it? The first time you do something, you really struggle and you wrestle through the rights and the wrongs and, ah, and then you give in. Well, then the next time comes. Maybe you had a pang of conscience. I can't believe and then a little girl says, hey, weren't you with me? Not me. you got to be kidding. I, I, wasn't, I don't know him. Then he begins to realize the circumstances that maybe he could be put on trial too. And So now it was put to him in the form of an accusation. You were one of his followers. And now he denies even cursing that he knew him. And the cock crows. Scriptures record for us that Jesus caught his eye. I can't imagine the nonverbal communication that Peter must have been feeling. We have no idea what that look of Christ was like. Imagine what was going on in his soul. And so the events transpire. Jesus is unduly condemned and put to death. And they're all scattered. John was there at the cross, but the rest of them had all fled. Jesus begins to appear to them and sees them in the upper room and communicates with them, and still they're, they're not getting it. It's wonderful that He's come, but then He goes. Thomas doubts, and so Jesus lovingly comes and confirms to him that He is alive and resurrected from the dead. And they believe He's resurrected, but they're thinking, yeah, you know, but it's not like you're really alive. Finally, in this final appearance, Jesus confirms to them, I am risen from the dead, and you've got work to do, and I'm going away, and the Comforter will come. And I'm not establishing the kingdom right now, and you don't need to be worried about the details of it, but you've got work to do, and you are going to receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. And now they obey Him and they begin to make their way back to that place of waiting. See what God's going to do. And they get to that room. And what do they do? They realize they have to depend upon God. And so they continue in one accord in prayer and supplication. We've got to seek God. We can't just reach out and ask Jesus our questions. We can't just go to Him and, and, and get the answers. We can't be reassured by laying our head on His breast. He's not there for us to touch or feel. We've got to learn what it means to truly depend on God and take Him at His word that He said He would never leave us nor forsake us. And so they come to God in prayer. You know the reality of it is, folks, that most of us in our prayer lives fail because 
we fail to realize our utter dependence on God. We live so much of our lives understanding that we can do it. I mean, the reality of it is, if it really came to the place for me that I was hungry, somehow, some way, I could find, manage to get something to eat. Most of us. There's some that, that can't. I've got a problem. I can find a way to, to get it figured out, get it fixed, get it done. And then ultimately, I come to that place where maybe I then face something and we make an expression like, man, I have done everything else. I guess I'll have to pray. Like it's, the, it's the last ditch effort. I mean, that, that is it. It's like men with instructions. I've done everything I can to get this thing together. I guess I'm going to have to read the instructions doesn't make any sense but boy it sure feels good when you get it together without the instructions and i think that's what motivates us and the reality of it is that is the heart behind our prayerlessness there's something to my self-sufficiency that if i can get it done on my own somehow i feel self-satisfied and the reality of it is folks we can do nothing on our own there is not one thing i will be able to do today in and of myself with my own energy to make myself more spiritual it's God that worketh in you to will and to do of His good pleasure. We're told to seek after God so that He in working in us will be able to strengthen us with all might in the inner man. He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. The reality of it is I live in spiritual vulnerability whenever I choose to live a day independent of God. Prayer is not just some mantra. It's not just one of our religious affections. It's not just some duty. Ooh, wow, man, look at that. I went today and I didn't pray. I better pray because, you know, if I don't pray, then somehow I might not get that spiritual reward. Or, boy, I, you know, the, the lightning is sure to come if I spend too long without, without praying. For many of us, we are telling ourselves we are just like Daniel. We pray three times a day, breakfast, lunch, and supper. And the reality of it is, we are prayerless. Do I really commune with the Almighty, recognizing that I am utterly dependent upon Him for everything? That I need His insight to be able to see things as they really are, rather than them being tainted merely by my fallible human perception. God, help me to see the real value in the circumstances of life. God, help me somehow to look with spiritual eyes and see the real value in people, who they are, what they're like, what their needs are. God, help me not to wear the, the sunglasses which taint everything that I have and, and see of selfishness. That somehow on my own, I by default manage to interpret all of life as it would affect or impact me. God, help me to see it in light of who you are what you are doing, what you are saying, how it will bring glory to you, and then secondly, in light of how it might impact others. We find them for the first time, realizing Jesus is not coming back. It's no surprise then that we find them huddled in agreement in a prayer meeting. And it's there, I believe, that we are going to find, and we'll see it throughout this book, one of the secrets to the dynamic impact of the first generation church. They never attributed what was happening to themselves, to their programs, to their place. They never attributed any of it. They realized that this was an incredible, spiritual, dynamic work that God had to do. And He wanted to use them to do it. But in order for it to happen, they had to be utterly dependent upon Him. And they were willing to leave the circumstances of how God was going to accomplish that in His hands. And so here they are, together in one accord in prayer and we see Peter the speaker and in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said the number of names together were about 120 men and brethren the scriptures must needs have been fulfilled it's the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. Notice the number. It tells us there was 120. 
if you look kind of at the latter part of the Gospels and the post-resurrection ministry of Jesus, putting the numbers together, there probably were total four to five hundred what would be considered disciples or genuine followers of Jesus Christ post-resurrection. Four to five hundred. Three and a half years of ministry by the Son of God. Four to five hundred small number. 120 of them, the Scriptures tell us, are gathered here. At the time of Passover, particularly the High Holy Day, numbers vary. It all depends on what the historical setting was, but people estimate that, that in the whole province at that time, that there probably were somewhere between a half a million and four million people. We're talking about 120. Now, Jerusalem, Judea, this is, this is the group. You're going to go be witnesses to me. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost part. Of it. It's a small number, folks. There's, there, there's no doubt that looking at the task, hearing the promise, looking at themselves, they're thinking, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know how it can get done. I, I, I don't know how we're going to do it. I don't know what's going to happen. Well, we can't get there yet, but imagine what they were thinking after the first day when 3,000 trust Jesus Christ as their Savior and are added to the church. I've got this feeling that if this 120 was legitimately gathered in this upper room, and I'm not sure that necessarily they, they were, it would be pretty packed. Any room with 120 in it would be a big room. But do you think when 3,000 got saved, they thought, what are we going to do next Sunday? I mean, it's just awesome to, to contemplate what, what takes place in this book. By the time we get five chapters in, the church of Jerusalem is over 20,000 from 120. You know what, folks? We don't look at that and say, yeah, but that, there was miracles going on and all. No, folks. God did exactly what God said He could and would do. And they recognized that only God could do it. But God could do it. And so we see the, the number. Peter gets up in the, the middle of them. But then there's a need. In those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, he actually is, is going to make a statement to them. And the language here communicates that there was a discussion, at least, if not a conflict between them. The language in the midst and the summons, men and brethren, are indicators that there was a discussion going on. And Peter gets up to speak in a, an official capacity. His injunction, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, is a presentation that is being made as an answer to an argument of opposition. It was likely a debate that was going on between them as to whether or not Judas needed to be replaced. There probably was, and we don't have the historical account to, to know, but it seems like there was discussion, some of them of the opinion that the whole thing was a mistake and that's look what happened and that's why he shouldn't have been there and so Jesus got betrayed and all of that. But there was a discussion going on. It shouldn't surprise us that as we're now in this fledgling group that's going to become the church, that there's already areas of discussion going on. And Peter stands in the middle of them as a spokesman. It wasn't a foreign place for him. You look through the Gospels, we find that he was a spokesman of the disciples. He was a leader of the group. He often would give the official answer of the group when Jesus would answer, uh, ask a question. He wasn't just brash, by the way, though some of his statements were brash. It wasn't that Peter was always the first one to spout off. There really was a, a concept that he was a leader of the group. There were 12 disciples. They were broken into four groups of three. Those groups were prioritized. And so there was Peter, James, and John. And then out of that group, we find that Peter was actually the, in the elevated position. He was most likely the human leader of the disciples. And so he was an official spokesman. And so here he rises again in this group. And he speaks to the group because of the need that was taking place. Because there was a need for guidance and direction. 
But imagine what it must have meant to Peter to be back there again. Knowing he had betrayed, knowing that he had failed, knowing that he had come short, knowing that he had run away, knowing that he had quit. Now here they are back together and there's a discussion. Do I step up? Do I not? Do I speak out? Do I not? Do I know what's right? Do I not? You know, the reality of it is, we face that, don't we? Maybe I know what's right, but boy, I, I'm not sure. I, I, maybe, maybe I'll just hold my tongue. Maybe I won't say anything. Maybe I won't stand up. Maybe I won't speak. And, and you know what? Where, where would this scenario have gone? We don't know. But if Peter hadn't stood up and, and dealt with the truth and dealt with the scenario because he was too focused on his human fallibility, this scenario may have been very different. But we see Peter standing up in the midst of them. It probably was a, an act of great courage. Any of them could rightly have said, Who are you, Peter? Look what happened to us the last time we listened to you. The reality of it is, he realized his dependence upon God, and in that, then realized he must obey God. And that becomes a very important concept. Because it won't be long before we see Peter standing before the Jewish authorities who had crucified Christ and saying to them, you tell me whether I should obey God or man. Probably if he had never overcome the fears with regard to his peers, he may never have had the courage to stand before his foes. This little group very early learned by example that you need to stand for something. When you know truth, stand for truth. And they do. And the truth matters. So we see this speaker. It's amazing that it's Peter and it's so quick after his betrayal. Then I want you to see the suicide and it almost stands in stark contrast. It's interesting to me to contemplate Peter talking about Judas. Look at verses 18 and 19. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity and falling headlong. He burst asunder in the midst and all his bowels gushed out. And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem. Insomuch as that field is called in their proper tongue, Aseldama or Akeldama, that is to say, the field of blood. Verses 18 and 19, Luke is actually taking an aside. This is not Peter speaking. It's more that Luke is interjecting so that we understand what is taking place. And so he interjects this historical detail about Judas. And so these aren't necessarily Peter's words. They're Luke's words as an explanatory comment. In verse 18, Luke tells us that Judas bought a field with the wages of his iniquity. The field was purchased with his money, in a sense, by proxy, by the temple officials who had paid the bribe to Judas. These religious leaders, as you know the story, bribed Judas, offering him 30 pieces of silver for the purpose of him then, in exchange, betraying Jesus Christ. And so Judas, knowing him very well, knowing where he would be, knowing where he was going to pray, he leads this band of temple guards, of Roman soldiers, of the, the Sanhedrin, to the Garden of Gethsemane. And there with a kiss, he betrays Jesus Christ, identifying who Jesus was so that they could arrest him as though he needed any identification. Jesus walks out and meets them and says, who are you looking for? And twice they ask, they, they identify and he says, I am he. And they're knocked to the ground. And so Judas betrays him. The leaders, though, in their hypocrisy, won't take the money. It was blood money. Here they are. They're the ones that pay for the betrayal. But because they did, they, they can't now take the money. They're too spiritual for that. And so they have to do something with it. They take and buy a field. That becomes the place where Judas goes and takes his own life. We don't know what was going on in Judas's mind. There was some level of remorse. What that remorse was over, what it was caused by, we don't know. Maybe, maybe he never dreamt it would come to this. Maybe he knew Jesus well enough and thought that, that Jesus would take care of it. Maybe he never thought that they would actually find him guilty. 
Maybe they ne- he never dreamed that Rome would follow through with the injustice. We, we really don't know. But at some level, he is overcome with grief at what has transpired and that somehow he was the cause of it. It's an incredible picture and he, he is in great remorse. And so just imagine how powerful the imagery is for Peter and the other apostles. Peter had also betrayed the Lord. And while he didn't lead the authorities to Christ and have him killed, he denied that he knew him so that he could save his own life and allowed Christ to be abandoned. Peter was remorseful over his betrayal. John told us that he went out and wept bitterly. However, remorse would not have been enough. If Peter hadn't responded to the Lord's invitation to return, the story could have been much different. The reality of it is, folks, there is a great difference between remorse and repentance. Remorse is sorrow over wrongdoing, but it stops short of that which is necessary for forgiveness. In fact, Paul explains some of that. 2 Corinthians 7, 9-11, through 11, Paul writes to the church at Corinth. And he's following up on a letter that he wrote to them, challenging them about their sinful behavior. And he says this, Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. For behold this selfsame thing, that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you. And that word carefulness there means earnestness, reality, a sense of of dealing with what really has happened. Yea, what clearing. And and the word there is actually an an earnest or an eagerness to, to have yourself cleared, not just in taking away the accusation, but in actually dealing with the problem. Yea, what indignation. The word there, indignation, is that which stimulates you to make a change, to do something different. Yea, what fear. And the word there actually is calling for alarm. Something's gone wrong. Something has happened. Something's not right. Something needs to change. Yea, what vehement desire. And the, the word there is longing. I really want to be made right. I really want circumstances to change. Yea, what zeal, and the word means concern. And then he says another interesting thing, yea, what revenge. And the word actually means a readiness to see justice done even if it is applied to me. And he says, in all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. See, the reality of it is, Judas had great remorse, even to the point that history seems to indicate he took his own life. But you know what? The reality of it is, even in taking his own life, he could never justly pay for his own sin so that reconciliation could happen. Folks, there's a difference between remorse and repentance. Repentance takes another step. Remorse might see my own demerit, my own fault, my own guilt. Repentance, though, is a change of mind about that guilt that realizes I must have someone else's help to bring merit so there can be restoration. And so it also appraises what God has done or the work that God has done as the answer for my guilt. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The difference, the only difference between Judas and Peter is that one accepted what Jesus did in his behalf and the other didn't. Both were sorrowful. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. But repentance leads to life. If you're here today and you realize that you're a sinner, you do bad things, you don't always do the right thing, you don't always tell the truth, you don't always uh, do, do everything right, that, that there's things that are wrong, it is not enough for you to come to church today and say, oh, I'm sorry for those things, and somehow look to carry out some religious duty. Being sorry for what you've done wrong is not enough. It stops short. The reality of it is you must realize that the wages of your sin is death. and Somebody had to pay them. Either you will pay that sin debt eternally or you can accept the fact that somebody else paid your sin debt in your place because he didn't have a sin debt of his own. His name is Jesus Christ. And he died willingly, in my place, in your place, 
to pay a sin debt he didn't owe because we owed a debt we couldn't pay. Repentance says, I'll change my mind about myself. I'm not going to be good enough to get there on my own. I can't accomplish it through just doing good things. I need to be forgiven. I need to change my mind about myself and see myself as God sees me. I need to change myself, my mind about Jesus Christ and see Him as God sees Him. Realize He died that I might be forgiven. Turn from my sin and trust Him as my Savior. Oh, we see that Judas committed suicide. He was as remorseful as he could be. But the Bible confirms for us that his remorse didn't take him to heaven. The difference between him and Peter is that Peter stopped and realized what Jesus had done was for him. That he could be forgiven. Then we see the Scriptures. And with this, I'll close, because Peter stands up to give an answer. Well, what's his answer going to be? Well, I know Jesus better than any of you. I was one of the inner three, and I was the leader of them. I was there in places where you weren't. I went a little further with him in the garden. I got to go up on the Mount of Transfiguration, so you all need to listen to me. No. It had nothing to do with special privilege. How could he answer this dispute, this discussion? Notice what he does. Verse 20. For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric let another take. He actually quotes two passages of Scripture from the Psalms and puts them together. Psalm 69, 25 and Psalm 109, 8. Neither of them mention Judas. But he says that it was talking about Judas. Somehow Peter knew now enough to go back and look at the Scriptures and to take them and apply them accurately to their circumstances. That somehow he had to take the Scriptures, he had to interpret the Scriptures, and he had to apply the Scriptures to their present discussion. And that's what he does. The reality of it is, this may be the closest example at the beginning here of, of preaching. We're going to take the Scriptures... And not just see that there's some value in the fact that they're Scriptures, but the value is found in the taking the truth and accurately applying it to our lives so as to live in light of it. How is he going to answer this question? Should they replace Judas? Should they not? Was Judas some colossal accident that caused all of this disaster? Or was it in the plan of God? And very clearly he says, guys, you need to understand, there wasn't any luck involved in this. There wasn't any chance. It wasn't just fate. When we look back at the Psalms, we realize that they're talking about Judas, and he was even in the plan of God. Judas, in a sense, was in those circumstances, and God used him as a mechanism by which Jesus Christ would go to the cross of Calvary. As horrible as that was, as unjust as it seemed as it was, it was the plan of God for the redemption of lost men. Jesus called him. He says he was numbered with us. That means somebody did the numbering. And when he did that numbering, he apportioned out ministry in 12 pieces. And somebody else is supposed to take his place per the Psalms because there are 12 pieces and that piece of the work needs to be done. Therefore, he needs to be replaced. It seems very simple. But the reality of it is, it was simple because Peter took the Scriptures and used the Scriptures to answer the question. You know what, folks? Just as the church, if it's going to survive and thrive as the first generation church did, it found a priority in prayer. We must find a priority in the Scriptures. And yes, I believe we've got to learn to take them and accurately handle them and apply them to our circumstances in a way that is in keeping with the intent of the Scriptures. But the fact of the matter is, they have got to become essential for us in our living. Can you truly say as you look at your life that the Scriptures are your only authority for what you believe and what you do? our authority for faith and practice, they were insisting upon it because they realized this is the only way we're going to survive. Jesus isn't here. And when Jesus was here, what did He do? He constantly went to the Scriptures. He constantly gave us an answer, but He always took us back to the Scriptures. The Scriptures say, the Scriptures say, the Scriptures say. And He accurately handled it. Whenever the Pharisees were misusing the Scriptures, He said, you have heard it said of old time. 
But I say unto you, and he took and he reapplied the Scriptures and he intensified them by internalizing them. Apply the truth to your heart. And we're going to see this little group in its first question, in its first discussion, in its first decision, make prayer a priority and make the Scriptures a priority. And it's because of those two things, I believe, that we will see the dynamic working of God in them and through them to establish the church. And thus they lay out criterion for who could be. By the way, out of all of them, there were two. And when you look at the criterion that were there, it had to be with us all the way from the beginning all the way to the end. From the baptism of John all the way to the ascension, it had to be with us. By the way, that does not include Paul. He didn't qualify. This wasn't any mistake. It wasn't a rush to judgment. Well, let's, we don't have anything else to do. Why don't, we, hey, why don't we replace Judas? No, it was an essential thing for them because the Scriptures instructed them to do it. And they knew there were criterion for what it meant to be an apostle rather than just a follower or disciple of Jesus Christ. By the way, if these are the criterion for what it means to be an apostle, there aren't any today no matter what names people might say or what special authority they want to designate themselves with as some kind of ruler over the church, there aren't any today. The office of apostle ended. Why? Because the criterion for it ceased. No one could meet these criteria. And so they select Matthias, and they did it with an interesting way. They did not roll dice. Somehow when we talk about casting lots, that's what we tend to think. Well, they just kind of rolled the dice and went with it. No, this was an Old Testament practice. And notice, when they did it, they prayed, God, we're going to draw the lots. And we believe that through that, you will get your choice. They submitted to God. And by the way, it's the last time in the book of Acts we'll see the process done. This is the last time we're going to see anything determined or selected this way. It was very much Old Testament before the Holy Spirit comes in chapter 2 and verse 1. But what it displayed was they were in complete dependence and submission upon God, even in this decision. And so they prayed and they said, God, you make your choice and you show us your choice for the drawing of lots. And they drew the lots between these two men and God ordained that it would be Matthias. And it's interesting, we never hear his name again in the whole book of Acts. We tend to think, wow, what a great privilege. He won the lottery. I won't take the time to read it to you today, but you know what? The reality of it is, read through the men, including Matthias, and historically, see the deaths they all went to. He didn't win the lottery. He was appointed to a place of ministry that he might serve God by serving others, and it cost him his life. And so there's a sense in which here, this wasn't some great privilege that he got to, wow, you won, you won the draw. It was a humbling thing that God chose him to do his work. We look at this little group, and it isn't any accident that we find them abiding in prayer because Jesus is gone. It isn't any accident that we find Peter rising to speak with an understanding of what God had done in his life, that he might be restored. It isn't any accident that we find him standing to speak, not based on his own authority or his own strength of personality, but on the authority of the Word of God. And then they submit their hearts to God. And you know what? Those truths are what God is going to dynamically use to take this group of 120 and change a culture and change a world. And folks... Those things are essential for us. God, I'm a wicked sinner. It's not about me, my strength of personality, or what I can do. If it weren't for Christ, I could do nothing. God, I'm going to abide before you in prayer because if anything gets done, you're going to have to do it. God, I'm going to follow your word because I don't have enough wisdom to know what to do and when to do it and how to do it. And so I'm going to submit to the authority of your word. I will search it diligently so I can know it and understand it and apply it to life so I can live it out. And then, God, I'm going to remain in submission to you. I want your will and not mine. That is the essential truth of this little group God's going to visit 
and dynamically change to birth the church.